Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Victorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, old sports. Welcome back to the Hello, Old Sports podcast here on the Sports History Network. This week, it is part two of our two-part series on the LaSalle Explorers men's basketball team the pride of 20th and Olney in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am joined, as always, by my brother, co-host, and LaSalle alumni, Andrew Newman. Andrew, how are you doing? I am doing well, Dan. I enjoyed our first episode, a trip down the very early history of the school and the uh, early origins of the program, and then the interview with David, where we talked quite a bit about Tom Gola and the Tom Gola years at LaSalle. And then, uh, you know, we touched on some of the, I guess the decade after, uh, after Go- the Gola era ended. And Andrew is referring to David Grzbowski, who joined us on the last episode to talk about Tom Gola and his book, Mr. All Around the Life of Tom Gola with a forward by the legendary broadcaster and legendary drinker, Bill Raftery. So check that episode out. Check out David's book. And before we begin, of course, a reminder to check us out on Facebook and check us out on Apple Podcasts. Give us a rating and also to check out all of the other great shows we have here at the Sports History Network at sportshistorynetwork.com. Andrew and I have guested on a few shows recently and we'll likely be doing so again in the future. So As we get to the end of the 1960s, the LaSalle team, the LaSalle basketball program is in some trouble and they call on Tom Gola to resurrect them. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? So sure. Just to sum, we touched on it a little in the interview with David in last episode, but um, just to to quote, actually, to read from David's book and to to catch everybody up. The 1967-68 team was the first team to get to the NCAA tournament. It's 55, uh, goal of senior year. They have a coach named Jim Harding who is really driving some of the players to the point of not being pleased with them. I think one of the last things we talked about last week was com- there was a quote from a Philadelphia Bulletin writer, uh, the newspaper named Frank Bolovsky, comparing him to Sergeant Slaughter, the old villain wrestler in the WWF. So there were players who were actually on the fence about staying because of Harding, but then the NCAA intervenes and due to a couple of, I don't don't know if scandals is the right word, probably not. I guess infractions would be the right word. So starting in 1965, there was a company called A to C house cleaning service. And they had a work study program with LaSalle students. And essentially they had paid six student athletes, four basketball players and two swimmers for work that they didn't compete uh, complete and that they had falsified time cards. So basically they were in a work study. They weren't actually doing work for, but they were still getting paid. The four players were Larry Cannon, Bernie Williams. I am very sorry that I don't know how to pronounce uh it's it's a Polish name. Wodarczyk. Wod- Wod- that might make me a bad LaSalle alumni. I've seen the name before, but I've never seen it. I've never heard it. I've only seen it written. And then Ken Durrett, who we'll talk about in a little while. So there were some sanctions coming. And then on top of that, the NCAA also stated that LaSalle had violated another rule when a coach of the freshman basketball team had operated an incentive system, giving out payments of about 25 cents to his players for outs, uh, for outstanding performances. And that 
LaSalle coach had advised at least one student to withhold information while being interviewed as part of this investigation. So Harding was relieved of his duties and the school was placed on a uh, night. They would go into the 1968-1969 season ineligible for postseason play. Uh, so they would not be allowed to go to the NCAA tournament should they have a good enough season to qualify for it. This type of thing was common in those days, I think, sort of the, you know, it's probably still common now, but it wasn't as reported on even UCLA and the vaunted John Wooden and the the guy's name escapes me at the moment. But there was this guy who right around the same time was getting money and cars and whatever else for Lou Cinder, soon to be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and all these other star UCLA players. So this type of thing, it maybe wasn't done on as grand a scale as 20 or 30 years later, but this was something that you saw a decent amount of in college basketball around this time. So we talked about it with, with David last week. LaSalle goes back to their uh, past. They bring Tom Gola in. Gola had, after LaSalle, gone on to a very successful NBA career, first with the Philadelphia Warriors and then with the New York Knicks. He had retired and gotten into sort of local politics. He was in the state legislature, but the school in their hour of need reached out to him and he answered the call, became the head coach of LaSalle going into the 1968-1969 season, knowing they would not be eligible for postseason play, still stayed in the state legislature like we talked about. And that's why his tenure at LaSalle was pretty brief because it was just almost impossible to do both. But he inherited a team that had been in the NCAA tournament the year before, was returning most of that team. And on top of that, added in a sophomore because now we're in the era where freshmen could not play, added in sophomore Kenny Duress, the second of the Mount Rushmore of LaSalle basketball players, uh, the second chronologically. And some people will tell you the second from a stature standpoint, heading into the 1968-69 season, they added Kenny Durrett to what was already an NCAA tournament team the year before. And you don't get the impression, or at least I don't in, in reading David's book and just in looking around, you don't get the impression that Gola intended this to be a long-term thing, as is evidenced by the fact that he stayed a, a state, um, you know, a, a state representative and elected official this was not something he intended to do for a very long time. So the 1968-1969 team, and again, knowing the whole time that they're ineligible for postseason and postseason play, may have been the best LaSalle team in history. Certainly was the best LaSalle team in history in the last 60 years. They end up 23-1. and one. They end the year ranked number two in the nation. Obviously, don't go to the postseason. They end their season at, I think they went to Westchester University for their last game of the season instead of being on their way to the NCAA tournament. As we talked about with David, it's a little thin to me to imagine that they would have beaten the Lou Alcindor UCLA uh, team because nobody did, but they were ranked number two. So I guess it's not unreasonable to think they might have been a Final Four team or a national champion, uh, you know, a contender for the maybe even playing in the national championship game. One of the great what ifs, the only loss they had in that year was night, uh, December 30th to South Carolina. But, you know, they beat some pretty heavy hitting teams. They went four and oh in the big, uh, in the big five. And they played in February, February 8th, 1969. They played in what a lot of people still consider the biggest and most important big five game of all time against Villanova, who was led by Howard Porter. LaSalle was number seven going into the game. Villanova was number eight. So both teams were in the top 10. It was a game that was, you know, obviously sold out, packed, and LaSalle, and I'm going to pull up a Sports Illustrated article on it to go over some of the details, but LaSalle wins the game, I believe, by seven points, and that really shot them up in the rankings. But this is still a game that, you know, every couple of years, the local sports, you know, NBC, Comcast Sports, Philadelphia, or whatever it is now, plays this game occasionally because they do still have all the footage of it. Yeah, the one their one loss is to Frank McGuire, who we alluded to a little bit. We talked about him a little bit last week. One of the first coaches to 
travel south. One of the first New Yorkers started his career at St. John's and then went on to North Carolina um, for about seven or eight years and then on to South Carolina when and was replaced at North Carolina by Dean Smith. So this South Carolina team that they lost to in 69 was they were a powerhouse. This was a very good team that they lost to. Yeah. So this, this is a contemporary sports illustrated article from the time. And they're talking a little about Gola's, what he does, his assistant coach, Kurt, Kurt Frommel or from again, another name I should know, but I've only ever seen it typed said, I don't know how he does it physically. His schedule is inhuman. It isn't the many jobs so much. It is the people who want to see him. Everybody wants something from Tom to so LaSalle came into the game despite a 20 and eight record. And they're talking about the, uh, the scandal. And I think the thing about Gola is that a, you talk about everybody wanting to talk to him and the crazy schedule. This was a guy who was a lifelong Philadelphian. He grew up in Philly. He went to college in Philly, he played a, most of his NBA career was played in Philly. Now all of a sudden he's coaching at his alma mater and he's also in the state legislature. So you got to figure in addition to his two very high profile jobs, he also I'm sure had family commitments and all this thing. This was, you know, his whole life was Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Yeah. So LaSalle, it was a nip and tuck game early on. LaSalle led 34 33 at halftime. Porter had a big stretch, 10 straight points in the second half. Villanova was down just two with four minutes left in the game. Eventually, LaSalle was able to get up 68 61, and that was the end of the game. The article does punctuate, though, that even though Villanova lost, Villanova is the team that's going to be going to the NCAA tournament and LaSalle's got a handful of games left before they end the season. So just again, it's, it's tough to put into context how big a deal that game was at the time in Philadelphia, you know, two top 10 teams and, and certainly the last 10 years or so Villanova's had a crazy run where they've, you know, won a couple of national, I'm talking about 10 years now where they've been national championships a couple of times. They're, you know, a, a blue blood program essentially at this point, but in this era, and I've heard, you know, I, I have not really interacted with anybody who remembers the goal of teams or certainly who was in school during the goal era. There's still plenty of guys around who remember this 68, 69 team. And, you know, they all talk about, you got to remember the time too. you're a college student. There's not, you know, there's no internet. There's no, you know, if you have TV in your dorm room and who even knows if you have TV in your dorm room, what do you get? A couple channels. There's no video games. The men's basketball team was the thing. And they were, you know, you would bust every game at the Palestra, regardless of who they were playing, but then you're playing a team in the same city. It's another Catholic school. It was you know, Villanova was always at least when I was there, and I'm assuming then seen as a little bit more of the suburban preppy school compared to some of the more blue collar schools like LaSalle. The other thing I noticed is that it, they're playing a lot of games at the spectrum in this season. So they must have been pretty big in the city if they were playing so many games. Obviously, their their big five games were at the Palestra, but it looks like they played, you know, one, two, three, four, five, like the ten, nine or ten games were played at the spectrum. And the spectrum was pretty new too if you think about it um, yeah at that point the spectrum was you know a, a little bit of a sometime in the mid 60s i believe the spectrum opened if even that and ironically in a little while we'll talk about them playing at the spectrum again when it was not because they were a big deal but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that so they win that game again they they go on and um you know they don't they obviously can't go to the ncaa tournament the next year goal is still coaches them but Outside of Durant, all the rest of those guys were seniors. So 68-69 was really their chance to make, you know, I mean, I mean not chance because they didn't have the chance, but that was their window. So the next year they fall to 14 and 12. Gola leaves after 1970, and we'll we'll start to talk about 71 and who came in. But um, you know, that that 69 team to me in certain instances, obviously it's a great what if story. But there is also the factor that maybe the fact that it's a what-if story and it got to stay a what-if story makes it even greater. And I'm not even talking about, oh, would they have beaten UCLA? But, you know, what if they went in and however, you know, what if they lost in the their second NCAA tournament game? You know what I mean? Would that team be remembered as fondly 
as they are now because they never got the chance. Obviously, if they went to the Final Four, it's a different story. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and there's not necessarily the Durant, obviously, you know, he's probably the the star, like you said, and one of the best basketball players in LaSalle history. But it's not like there's one guy you can point to. They didn't have an Elvin Hayes. They didn't have, uh, you know, a, an Al Cinder. So it's not like you can point to one guy and say, this guy would have dominated in the tournament. You just don't know. And Durant would have only been a sophomore as well. So just to talk about Ken Durant a little again, he played three years at LaSalle. And in a lot of ways, it's a bit of a, I don't want to say tragedy, but it's a heartbreaker, which we'll get to in a minute. So that first year with that really good team, you know, there's plenty of other stars on that team. Three other guys who went to the NBA. He still manages 20 points and just under 12 boards a game. And then the next two years as, um, you know, as obviously the unquestioned alpha dog on the team. As a junior, he averages 24 points a game and 12 rebounds. And then as a senior, he averages 27 points a game and 12 rebounds again. Uh, So think about 27 points a game. Yeah. Uh, But the heartbreaker. So in 1970-71, he's a senior and they you know, are having a, a good year and late, late-ish in the season playing Hofstra, January 30th, 1971. They're up big and he's in the game late and suffers a terrible knee injury that ends really his... He played in the NBA for a while, but he was a shell of himself. The closest analogy I can come up to come up with as somebody being familiar with him at all is Bernard King, just in terms of what that injury did to his career. It what yeah. didn't end this. It wasn't the last game he ever played in his career. But and you know, Derek Rose isn't a bad example either, although Derek Rose hung on for another 10 years, but he came back, but he didn't come back. You know, and maybe today it would be easier with the medical advances, but you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. So they do still manage and I'll, I'll pull up the Ritz pro career in a second. They do still, you know, manage to get to the NIT. So they get back to the postseason after, you know, not being eligible in 69 and they wouldn't have qualified in 70. So they get to the NIT, they lose to Georgia tech in the first round. But what is also interesting is that this is the first year after goal leaves he is replaced and the man who will remain the coach for the remainder of the 1970s, basically is Paul Westhead, leader of the Los Angeles Lakers, leader of the Loyola Marymount teams who will come back into this discussion in a little while playing a huge game against LaSalle in 1990. But at the time that was really his first big job and where uh, the Paul Westhead style got started was at LaSalle in the seventies. Yeah, Westhead is such an interesting story. You know, I'll just give a little rundown of his career here. So he does his 10 years or so at LaSalle. He goes to the Lakers for the 79-80 season as an assistant coach under Jack McKinney. About a third of the way into the season, Jack McKinney falls off his bike, and this was before people really wore bike helmets, really hurts himself. I think it was even a question about whether he would live for a little while. He ends up being okay, but then... Westhead takes over as the coach. This was a day you really only had one assistant coach. And Westhead takes over as the coach, and they bring the guy who had been doing the broadcasts, uh, the color commentator on the broadcasts, on as the assistant coach. And that was a guy named Pat Riley. So the Lakers win the title in 80, and that was the year Kareem gets hurt and Magic plays center. They win, and then... Starting the following year, West Head and Magic start to really clash. And I believe he got fired. I don't think it was the end of the 81 season. I think West Head got fired. It was in the middle of the 81-82 season that, uh, yeah, he was fired. And then he was replaced with with Riley. And I think there was a thing for a little while where Riley and Jerry West were going to be co-coaches or something like that. That's a story for a different day, obviously. But anyway, Riley becomes the coach. And that's when West Head goes on to... Loyola Marymount. This is not to be confused with Paul Westfall, who was a star for the Celtics and the Suns as a player in the 70s and then when later on, went, later went on to coach the Suns in, during the early 90s, during the Barkley years. But 
West Head, that's, and that's when he becomes this guru of go at Loyola Myra Mount, and there was the 30 for 30 made about it, and then goes to the Denver Nuggets. Then he coaches uh, four years in my neck of the woods, coaches at George Mason, and then he bounces around a little bit, coaches in the CBA, coaches in the Panasonic Super Kangaroos, which I'm assuming is in Japan, and it is. And then later on, he decides that he wants to get back into coaching. And so he's actually a, um, he coaches one year in the WNBA for the Phoenix Mercury. And then he's an assistant for a couple of years with uh, the Sonics and the Thunder. And then he closes out his career from 09 to 14 as, and it looks like he actually won a WNBA championship in his only year as their coach in 06, 07. And then for five years from 09 to 14, he's the coach of the Oregon women's team. And I'm guessing at the age of uh, now 82, he won't be back coaching again. But you talk about a guy who coached everywhere from, you know, winning a championship with the Lakers to college, to Japan, to the WNBA, to closing his career in major division one women's college basketball. This is a guy, you know, I don't know if there's a book out there about him, but there should be because he's just just a guy who's just been everywhere. And it's just sort of as an aside, I don't think you'll ever see another NBA championship winning coach coaching at George Mason 15 years later. But uh, who knows? Who knows what the future will hold? Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, I know after Raleigh Massimino left Villanova, he ended up down at Longwood. Well, where's Patino right now? Isn't he at Iona and he's about to play in the tournament? Yeah, I mean, Iona's... Yeah, I guess it's a fair comparison, but Patino had some personal issues. And Jim Calhoun is coaching some D2 or D3 team somewhere in Connecticut, too. Did these guys? I, I, love, I love where Jim Calhoun is because he's at St. Joseph's in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we like to do on the LaSalle message board is in order to sort of denigrate St. Joe's, and it, look, there's a lot of dirt. A lot of other schools can easily throw on LaSalle with some degrees of accuracy. So we, they always talk. They always like to talk about how iconic their brand is because of that stupid hawk. So we always refer to, and they get pissed at Kate. We're overblowing it, but a lot of times St. Joe's people will get mad when on like scoreboards and stuff it says St. Joe's with PA in parentheses. Like you shouldn't have to do that. Everybody knows which St. Joe's it is. So the fact that Jim Calhoun is at St. Joe's of Connecticut, I get tickled about that because it at least mentions another St. Joe's. But anytime on the message board. If you say anything about St. Joe's, you have to put of PA in there. Just to- <laughs> So Durrett played a few years in the NBA, mostly with the Kansas City Omaha Kings, you know, hung, hung around for a few years, but certainly, again, was one of those stories of if he hadn't blown his knee out and had that horrific injury, what could have been? I mean, his college career was wrapping up, but what could have been, you know, in the pros? So just to quickly touch on a couple other things in the seventies, cause I do want to get to, well, I want to get to the next, to the end of the seventies, but they did have a team that I really didn't know too much about. They made the tournament kind of sporadically in the seventies in uh, 74, 75, they went 22 and seven, won the ECC. This was the mid Atlantic had just become the ECC, but it was basically the same conference or it was the same conference, just obviously with some different teams, ECC East coast conference. They were ranked as high as seventh at one point in this year. They did lose to Syracuse in overtime in the first round of the NCAAs at the Palestra. But just to also point out, the best player on this team was a junior by the name of Joe Jellybean Bryant, who averaged 21 points and 11 and a half boards a game. And as we talked about a little David last time, Joe Jellybean Bryant is the father of the late, great Kobe Bryant. When was Kobe born? Was he born while Joe was at LaSalle? Kobe was born in 78, so he would have been in the NBA by that point. But he also played. I knew he was. I know Kobe was mostly raised in Italy. Yeah, because that's where Joe went later on. But Kobe was born during that time period was Joe basically. um, And this was territorial picks were over by this point but he was he was drafted by Golden State but then immediately traded to the Sixers before the season could start in the 75 76 season and then a year later was when the ABA folded and Dr. J came 
to the Nets. And that was that team with Dr. J and George McGinnis that went to the NBA finals. So Joe Bryant, in addition to LaSalle, played on some good Philly teams. And he, plus he was a Philly guy. So the, the Philly roots were deep for him. So what that brings us to is the next in the pillar of the sort of big four of LaSalle basketball. And that's the Michael Brooks era from 1976 to 1980. Again, now we're back to the point where guys can play all four years. So he was able to play as a freshman. Another Philly guy. Three of the list of the big four in LaSalle history are from Philadelphia. Ken Durrett was from uh, Pittsburgh. But um, Philly guy was on the team from 76, 77 through 79, 80. 20 point score, 20 point average all four years, actually. 25 as a sophomore and 24 the two years after that averaged a double double was over 10 boards each of those games another forward the team made the tournament a couple of times during the michael brooks era they made the tournament in i believe 78 and 80 let me just pull up the exact numbers here and then i want to focus on one specific game from the michael brooks era which was actually believe it or not a loss but was a an all-time classic game. But just give me one second to go back to the franchise index. Yeah, so 78 and 80. So his j- sophomore and senior year, they made the tournament, lost in the first round both years. In 1980, Michael Brooks was the college player of the year. He's still the 28th leading scorer in the history of college basketball. And as a sort of bonus that a lot of people don't know. And as I get to his post LaSalle career, I always wondered if this had something to do with it, but it doesn't sound like it. Michael Brooks would would have been the captain of the 1980 U S Olympic basketball team. Oh, really? He he had been named the captain of the eight because he had just great. He would have, you know, just been out of school, but not yet in the NBA. So he was in the right, you know, not in the pro. So he was in the right frame for that. And he had been named the captain, and that was the team that was not able to play because we boycotted the 1980 Summer Olympics. The whole U.S., not just LaSalle, boycotted the 1980 Summer Olympics as part of ongoing political yada, yada, yada. So I guess it never even occurred to me that it had gotten to that point. Um, But yeah, I mean, I I guess it did. As far as, you know, naming players or at least naming a captain. So there's a game from 1979 and the actual the big article here i have is from an uh, sb nation did like a retrospective on it their byu site is the one who did a retrospective on this it's a very long article so it's tr- hard to synthesize it but they played a triple overtime game lasalle did out in utah against byu that lead to this story says after a grueling triple overtime basketball battle, Michael Brooks stood in an arena more than 2000 miles away from home, listening to a crowd of 22,791 fans, BYU fans cheering his name. They saw it. It was two national players of the year in this game. Cause on LaSalle side, it was Michael Brooks and on BYU side, it was Danny Ainge, December 15th, 1979 Provo, Utah, Championship of the Cougar Classic between BYU and LaSalle. And they have it as the greatest game in the history of the Marriott Center. So the BYU arena. Brooks, BYU ended up winning 108 to 106 in three overtimes. Michael Brooks scored 51 points. That's actually kind of a low scoring game for three overtimes. 41 in regulation. uh, Ended up with 51 points. Yeah, Brooks had been, it mentions in here, Brooks had been the captain of the 79 Pan American team. So that's why they, you know, he'd already been named the 1980 team. Yeah. So this was actually, it was a new coach that year. West had left. Obviously by then he was winning a championship with the Lakers. 79, 80 was uh lefty Irvin, who I mentioned as a player on the, um, on the uh, previous team was a, was the new head coach after West had left. And this has always been seen as sort of the, signature Michael Brooks LaSalle game. Obviously unfortunate that it was in a loss, but I mean, if you think about what he did, 51 points, triple overtime, had an arena full of people in Utah who I'm sure had never heard of him before that game, chanting his name, 
So, you know, if you can look, look it up, you can look up the article. It's on a website called vanquishthefoe.com. It's from, you know, seven years ago at this point. It's called the Marriott Center's Greatest Game, BYU's 1979 bout with Michael Brooks and LaSalle. We'll put a link in the show notes. Brooks is an interesting story because after LaSalle, he played a little bit in the NBA. He was with San Diego, went over to Europe and played in France and Switzerland and never came back, never really talked to anybody, basically had dropped off the face of the earth from a United States standpoint. And I had always sort of, without knowing anything, I was like, I wonder if he felt a little jerked around by what happened with that 1980 team. Mm. But it was funny because like in 2013, when LaSalle made the Sweet 16 run, Ken Durant unfortunately died in a car accident in, I believe, 2001. And Tom Gola, as we talked about with David, was you know, in a, in a uh, facility, limited mental faculties. Lionel Simmons, who we're going to talk about in a minute, was with the team the whole time, traveled right with them from Kansas City to L.A. Brooks, and I was like, I wonder if somebody's going to track down Michael Brooks and get a quote. And it didn't happen. And finally, a couple of years later, a r- writer for the Philadelphia Daily News, like, managed to do a big piece on Michael Brooks and what happened and why he disappeared and talked to his family. And I guess he had a son that was not widely acknowledged that, you know, grew up in the United States, but, you know, still was a very enigmatic story, you know, had a family over in Europe. And then shortly after that article came out, he passed away. Did they talk to him for the article? As best I can remember. Yes. Okay. I could not find the article as best I could remember they did speak to him, but yeah, just never came back. You know, wasn't like he was specifically mad at the LaSalle program. I think he just decided to start a, you know, to maintain his life over there and sort of was just gone. Hi everybody. Dan here. I just wanted to cut in real quick and talk to you about a new partnership here at the sports history network. And that's with a great website called newspapers.com. At newspapers.com, you can get access to over 640 million pages worth of news from the U.S., Canada, England, Scotland, Ireland, and more, dating all the way back from 1798. I've used it not only in preparation for this podcast, but also in some of my academic work, and also just to satisfy my general curiosity about sports history, political history, or whatever other random bits of esoterica pop into my mind on a daily basis. So why am I cutting into the middle of an episode to talk to you about this? Well, if you've been listening, you just heard Andrew talk about an article from the Philadelphia Daily News about LaSalle star Michael Brooks, and how he was unable to find that article. I used newspapers.com to find the article, actually a two-parter from August 15th and 16th of 2017 in the Philadelphia Daily News. The articles talk about Brooks' basketball career, his relationship with his family, and the life he built in Europe in the 30 years before his death. And we wouldn't have been able to find it without newspapers.com. Get a free one-week subscription to newspapers.com by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. And with a paid subscription, you'll also be helping to support the production of this and other Sports History Network shows. That's sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. Thanks for checking out newspapers.com, and thanks as always for listening to Hello Old Sports. He leaves in 80. They continue on in the early 80s as, as a pretty good team. Actually, in 1982-83, they win an NCAA tournament game for the first time since the Final Four in 1955. Every other time they'd gotten there, they had lost in the first round and or in their first game. And the team that they defeated in the 1982, or I guess the 1983 NCAA tournament in their first uh, game they defeated the Boston University Terriers 70 to 58. Still hurts to this day. Even though, well, you were alive. <laughs> For the end of it, I guess I was. Yes. So um, LaSalle, uh, LaSalle, they won that game. It was a preliminary round, and then they lost to VCU the next round in the NCAA tournament 76 to uh, 67. They made the NIT in 84 the next year and lost in the first round to Pittsburgh. And then we move on to the next team, big uh, sort of next era. And the final, before you get to that, I would just note that the head coach of the BU team in that 82, 83 season was the aforementioned Rick Pitino. 
Yeah, that was trying to bait you the other night on my show until I realized I don't think you were listening. No, 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 no. I was uh, not feeling very well on Monday night. Why? What were you saying? Because they, they made a thing that Patino was the first coach ever to take five different teams to the NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, well, obviously Iona, Kentucky, Louisville, Providence. And then I kept naming teams like Stony Brook and Fairfield. Like, <laughs> And then after like the fourth time I did it, I was like, yeah, he's probably not listening. Um, yeah, no, I apologize. I, I did miss that one last week. I was, uh, I had, I basically took a nap from like six 30 to nine o'clock. Do not knock it. That's, <laughs> that's the way to do things. So what we're going to do now is move to the late eighties, the fourth era of what I was talking about starting in 1986, 80, like I said, after Westhead, the coach is a guy named lefty Irvin starting in 82 things happened in 1986, 87 altered the program in a good way and, and had an effect on the program for a very long time. The first thing was that in 1986, 87, Speedy Morris took over as head coach. He had been the women's coach actually, and ended up getting hired as the men's coach when there was a vacancy. It was one of the very few coaches in college, even then, who did not have a college degree. And obviously taking over at going from being the women's coach to the men's coach was something that was not uh, common then or now. It's probably even less common now because it's seen as more two different total styles. And Speedy Morris, and we will unfortunately talk about later on in his tenure, but Speedy Morris would hold that job until 2001 and would become the winningest coach of all time at LaSalle and the losingest. Incidentally, I, and I looked at his picture and I said, this guy doesn't look too speedy. And he acquired the nickname because he was one of the slowest kids in his neighborhood. Yeah. And he was very, he was a guy who, you know, pretty quickly after the tip off, the coat would come off and he'd slam it on the ground and be storming about. So he was, and again, there'll, there'll be more on speedy a little later, but he took over also in 1986, 87 was the beginning of the L train era. Lionel Simmons was a freshman that year from Philadelphia. I believe he went to South. You know what? I got to look this up because otherwise people will get mad at me. But I believe he went to South Philadelphia High School. You know, had been pretty heavily recruited, came to LaSalle. And all he did over the next four years was become the third leading scorer in NCAA history is still fourth, actually, was just passed very recently as the all-time leading, or as the for third all-time. I just confirmed he did, in fact, go to South Philadelphia High School. Philadelphia High School was third in, in NCAA scoring history, was the National Player of the Year in 1990, and we'll talk about the 90 team in a second. Just to give you kind of his numbers, points per game each year, 20.3, 23.3, 28.4 and 26.5. Also, I forgot to mention this was when LaSalle, I believe it might have been the year before that, joined, or excuse me, in 83 84, LaSalle joins the MAC. They find they leave the ECC Mid Atlantic, which had been their conference for about 30 years. They joined the MAC, which at the time was LaSalle, St. Peter's, Iona, Fordham, Fairfield, Holy Cross. Army and Manhattan. So all of this now that we're going to talk about with Simmons is while they're in the Mac. In 1987, they make a run all the way in the NIT. They went 20 and 13. They made a run in the NIT all the way to the championship game, and they ended up losing. And I mean, look, by then I'm not going to pretend the NIT then was just as big, you know, by 1987, the NIT was definitely a second tier tournament. But for a mid-major type school like that, that, it means a lot to do that. So Simmons came in right away and was their best player, but also Tim Legler is a name that obviously a lot of people will recognize now. He had already been on the team and he was a junior at the time. So the two of them were the two leading scorers on the team. And yeah, they get, I believe it was Southern Miss that they got, they got to the NIT championship at Madison Square Garden and ultimately ended up falling to Southern Miss in that game. They went on a nice run in the NIT, beating Villanova in the first round. Niagara, Illinois State, Little Rock, and then ultimately ended up losing by four at the Garden to uh, to Southern Mississippi. And they actually, if you look at LaSalle, the four big banners they have up are 52 national champion, 50 or 52 NIT champion, 54 national champion, 55 runner-up, 
and then 87 NIT runner up. So in terms of postseason success, it's one of the most successful years they've ever had. The next year, 87, 88, they added Doug Overton to their cast. Legler was still a senior. They got back into the NCAA tournament and lost to Kansas State as a 13 seed in 89. They lost Legler to graduation, but they added Randy Woods to their cast in 89. Another really good year. This time they get to the NCAA tournament as a nine seed and lose in the first round to Louisiana Tech. And that set up the best season LaSalle has had since 1968-69, which was the 89-90 season, Lionel Simmons's senior year. The Explorers they finished this regular season with one loss. They finished the season overall 30 and two. They finished ranked number 12 overall in the final poll. And Lionel Simmons won national player of the year. Now I mentioned before we would come back to this. And unfortunately, just like the BYU Michael Brooks game, the most famous game that that LaSalle team played that year was on January 6th, 1990, their one regular season loss at the Philadelphia civic center to Loyola Marymount, which was the team of two Philly guys who had gone to California to play at USC and then decided to leave USC and go play at Loyola Marymount with Paul Westhead. And that was Bo Kimball and Hank Gathers. The game was a huge deal. LaSalle ended up losing 116 to 121 to 116 at Philadelphia Convention Hall. I believe the game was on national TV. It's another one that occasionally they still play. Four Philly guys, or you know, two Philly guys on that team had gone to high school at the same time as Simmons. The LaSalle team had a bunch of uh, Philly guys on it as well. So just a really unique matchup. And of course, not too long after that, you know, one that for Loyola Marymount ended in tragedy with uh, with the death of Hank Gathers. Yeah, and he gathers he collapsed during a game and had a heart attack, and then you know that in in the subsequent game because he was a left handed free throw shooter, and then for his first free throw, his you know his best friend Kimball at the beginning of you know the next game after Gathers' death shot the ball with with his left hand in tribute to gather. So I knew this story, but that's obviously a really sort of interesting tie in with Philly and with LaSalle. When you factor in that Westhead is the coach. And then you have these two guys, these two Philly guys gatherers and Kimball as part of it, not to mention the fact that they had just played LaSalle in such an epic game only a month or so before. Yeah. So the Simmons was obviously the best player on the team, Doug Overton, and Randy Woods were also right there as starters. The sixth man on the team was a guy named Bobby Johnson, who was also a high school teammate of Lionel Simmons, is an active member on the LaSalle message board that I uh, am a moderator on. His son, BJ Johnson, is LaSalle's most recent player to go to the NBA. Uh, right now he's in the G League, but he kind of, you know, he's gotten a few few stretches in the NBA, went to Syracuse for a couple of years and then decided to transfer back to play his old man's uh, alma mater. And because of that, well, before that, but during a lot of the BJ Johnson era, you would see Lionel Simmons sitting with Bobby Johnson at most LaSalle games. You know, it looks like BJ Johnson's actually with the Nets right now. He's with the Long Island Nets with the Nets G League team. Yeah, he's he's had a he's been like the last few years he's been one of the best players in the G League. Gotten a few cups of coffee with the Hawks, and I think he was with Orlando's G League team for a long time. I'm seeing Hawks, Kings, and Magic. Yeah, he was very briefly on the Kings at like the very end of a season, but you know he's still kicking around and he plays in the G League at a pretty high level. So, and you touched on something there, and maybe it's something you get to when you talk about the more modern era, but. That seems to me like that happens a lot where guys from the Philly area go play somewhere else and then they transfer back to LaSalle later in their college career. We will touch on that. So to end the 90 team, it unfortunately ends with a little bit of disappointment. And the reason it ends with a little bit of disappointment is because, again, they were they were a one-loss team. They won the MAC championship, beating Fairfield, Siena, and Fordham in the MAC tournament. So they went into the NCAA tournament as a fairly high seed. I want to say they were a four seed, toggling between 
uh, yeah, they were a four seed. Um, and they beat Southern Miss 79 to 63 in the first round. And then in the second round, so had they won this, they'd have been on their way to the Sweet 16. They blew a big first half lead to Clemson, who was the five seed, and ended up losing by four. So despite being a four seed and having a you know one loss regular season, there's a big difference between I feel like losing in the second round and getting to the Sweet 16, you get that whole extra week, you go to the, you know, you get to go to the regional final arena and all of that. So a slight bit of disappointment there. And although we did not know it at the time, we were very close to the precipice. At the precipice of winning? No. So in 1992, obviously Simmons is gone after the 90 season. 92, they get to they get back to the NCAA tournament at 20 and 11. They're 12 and 4 in the MAC. They're a 13 seed. They lose by two to Seton Hall in the first round in 92. 90, well, the year between that, they made the NIT. So the year after they lost Lionel in 91. Lionel, by the way, was drafted like sixth overall to Sacramento. And I didn't realize this when I looked at this. He played quite a career. He played like eight seasons with Sacramento. He was in the NBA for a really long time. I remember him as a player, Lionel Simmons, but... He unfairly gets labeled as a bust. And certainly where he was picked you would be expecting more of a professional career, but people make it seem like immediately he was a bust. And if you look at his numbers, first of all, he got drafted to an awful Kings team in the early nineties. And second of all, he was off to a very good beginning of his career. And he started to get hurt. You know, his rookie year with Sacramento, he played in 79 games and he averaged 18 points The next year, he averaged 17.1. The next year, 17.9. And in 93-94, his fourth year, he was still averaging 15 points a game, five or six rebounds a game, and playing, you know, games played. So he was a starter pretty much the whole whole time. 79 games played, 78 games played, 69 games played, 75 games played. And then in, you know, 94-95, he was only started in three games. The next year, he only started in five games. He only played in the 50s, each of those. And then in 96, 97, he played in half the season and didn't start at all. So he got hurt a bunch, and that derailed his career. And then on top of that, he gets unfairly... Anytime you see... He had an injury. I believe he got hurt playing Nintendo. So he ends up on a lot of the, like comical injury lists like when guys get bit by a dog like a you know like when david Cohn got nipped by his mom's little like jack russell terrier or when a guy accidentally like falls down the stairs at his house or something like that so i think that combined with the fact that he didn't have a a long career makes it seem like oh he didn't pan out from day one when if you look at his first few years he was had good numbers for a young player yeah he did he it was game boy he got so it was like a carpal tunnel type of syndrome or something oh yeah so uh but it says to me he only missed two games but that's but that's what i'm saying people like go oh he was the guy who got hurt playing the game boy you know what i mean it gets reduced and it gets folded in with legitimate injuries he has and it's sort of I also think that th- all that stuff was so new in those days and it's excusable. Nowadays, when you hear about these guys, you know, what was their pitcher for the Red Sox a couple years ago who spent too much time playing Fortnite or something and he had to miss a start? Like in 2019 or 20, you should know. But it, it, back then, you probably didn't even think of it, you know? Yeah. So, 92, they make the NCAA tournament. They lose in the first round. We are now going to, unfortunately head into a different era of LaSalle basketball. One that you could argue is still going strong today, although there were certainly a few blips. A couple of things to talk about. We mentioned LaSalle had been in the MAC during all the Lionel years. And, uh, you know, before that they were in the ECC, Mid-Atlantic, whatever. By their last year in the MAC, the league was Manhattan, LaSalle, Siena, Loyola, Maryland, Iona, Niagara, Fairfield, St. Peter's, Canisius. Not a great league. Most of those teams are still in the MAC, actually. So they make their first of what could be considered many blunders the, a few years later when they go to 
the Midwest College Conference. And right off the bat, that should be a red flag to you because Philadelphia is not in the Midwest. The first year they joined the Midwest Conference, the teams in this conference were Xavier in Cincinnati, Evansville, LaSalle, Detroit Mercy, Duquesne, Butler, Dayton, and Loyola. So there's some decent names on that list. Xavier, there's some good names on that list. Xavier, Butler, Dayton, even Duquesne. The problem was the closest team to LaSalle was Duquesne. And a lot of them, you know, Detroit, Mercy, Loyola, not exactly going to fill up the stands in Philadelphia to see those teams. And you're spending more money on travel and things like that. And the league got worse the next few years they were in it because by the next year, it was down to six teams in the league. It was Xavier, Evansville, Butler, Detroit Mercy, LaSalle, and Loyola. And by the year after that... And we should just clarify, this is Loyola, Illinois, not the Loyola in California with Westhead and Kimball and Gathers that we were just talking about. By their last year in the league, their third year, it was Xavier, Illinois, Chicago, Green Bay, Detroit Mercy, Butler, LaSalle, Northern Illinois, Wright State, Cleveland State, Milwaukee, and Loyola. This is such an interesting conference because some of these teams like Xavier and Butler have gone in one direction. And I guess even Loyola, Illinois had some, some okay years if I, if I'm knowing this correctly, but then, I mean, Green Bay, Milwaukee, is Milwaukee even still a D one school? Their university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, they are. I believe okay. They, the story you've heard with that is they were under the impression a few other schools, Fordham among them, and maybe St. Joe's were coming with them. And the Midwest Conference was going to set up like an East Conference and a West or an Eastern Division and a Western Division. And, you know, it would make a little bit more sense. And those teams didn't come. LaSalle ended up being out there for the most part on an island. It didn't help that at the same time they were bad, getting as low as in 90. Well, that was their first, you know, they were 13 and 14, 11 and 16, and 14 and 13 in reverse orders in their years in the Midwestern Conference. They ultimately are allowed to join the Atlantic 10 in 1995 96. Unfortunately, the years in the Midwestern Conference and other factors, which we'll get into in a minute, led to them totally bottoming out in 95 96. They were 6 and 24. You know, at various points during this era, they did have some good players, but we are now into the 15 year stretch of losing seasons every year you know the midwest conference move hurt them dug them a hole that was very tough to get out of and the timing of it was bad to begin with again they finally get into the a10 but a lot of damage has been done which then brings us to the next problem so i had mentioned when lasalle was in the early 50s they were up until the early 50s they played at wister hall And they obviously played some other games elsewhere, but they played at Worcester Hall. Then they had the long stretch at the Palestra. And then they ended up at the Philadelphia Convention Center, like a lot of the Lionel Simmons eras. And I'm trying to pull up the exact dates. Yeah, so they were at the Palestra until 89. Then they were at the Philadelphia Civic Center until 1996. The Civic Center was closed and eventually torn down. So at this point, in 96. And if you are playing in an arena as a D1 college basketball team and you have to leave it because the city closes it down, it's probably a bad sign. But I mean, that said, if you watch like the Loyola game on TV, they were still drawing and it looks like a basketball arena. So 96, they're really kind of screwed. They don't have anywhere to go. So they end up playing at the spectrum. And this is bad for a couple of reasons. One, It's, you know, a long way from campus. So, you know, I'm sure they were running buses and things, but it's, you know, it's not an easy place to get to from LaSalle, at least for students and things like that. By this point, the Spectrum has been, the Sixers and Flyers have left the Spectrum and they're playing in, whether it was the Coors State Center or the First Union, I guess originally it was the Coors State Center. So they're playing in a building that's basically been, The Spectrum was around for 15 more years, but was an old arena at that point, was not the 
modern, you know, it was not a modern arena. And also it's not like, oh, because they were playing in the spectrum, they were seating 10,000 people. So playing in front of a few thousand people, if you're lucky in a massive stadium. is demoralizing. Yes. Especially when you're bad. So they make a good decision and everything about the decision is bad in the next few years. And they decide that for the first time since the days of Worcester Hall in the mid fifties, LaSalle is going to build or LaSalle is going to begin playing on campus. And what they do is they take a building called Heyman Hall, which had been like a recreational building for a long time and they renovate it and they turn the top floor into Tom Gola Arena. And from the day it opened, there were people who were like, this is a disaster. And it is a disaster. It is in every way a high school gym. It's a nice high school gym in terms of the court is clean and it's not like it's a, you know, stuff's not falling off the ceiling. And I've been there with you once or twice, and I kind of got that impression of, well, it had kind of a high schoolish feel. So essentially the, the main issue, and we won't go round and round on this because I do want to get to other stuff, but first of all, the most important issue, although it too often gets reduced to just this, there are no seats behind the baskets. It's when you watch the game on one side, there are the doors that you come into. So like when you come up the stairs to the built to the arena, you're eye level with the court as you're coming up the last flight of stairs. So there are, there are, that's one side. And the other side is a wall and some emergency doors. It looks awful on any kind of camera. There's no concourses. It's not like you walk out. It's two admittedly large sets of pull out bleachers on either side. It's on the, you know, it's on the upper floor of a building And this is a team that plays in a league with Dayton, who has their own 10,000-seat arena. It is the 13th best gym in the Atlantic 10 is closer to the best gym in the Atlantic 10 than it is to Gola, which is 14th. And that's, I think, a point that I would raise, too, because, you know, what you describe is very similar to what we have at BU, at my alma mater, but we're not competing with schools like that. We're competing with other Patriot League schools that are of a similar caliber. And and truthfully, the Marist College gym here is comparable but slightly better. <laughs> I'm not I'm not saying Marist College's gym is is any state of the art thing, but there's at least seats behind the baskets on a couple of like so anyway, we won't belabor that, but there were people who from day one were like, they blew this. This could have been something and it's nothing and it has led to even in decent times, it has kneecapped the program. So that's sort of the late nineties. You know, they do have some good players, but you know, Donnie Carr and Razul Butler who went on to a long career in the NBA, but they're still having losing season after losing season. Speedy Morris is still there. He had by that point, basically he's admitted in later years that by the late nineties, he had, lost all interest in recruiting. So he was just kind of, I don't know about stealing money, but he was not doing what he should have been doing. In what context has he admitted that? Well, so he went on and then became a a coach at St. Joseph's Prep High School and was there a very long time and did a, you know, was a very successful high school coach. But he has basically said that, yeah, he, you know, they just weren't doing the level of recruiting they should. And I'm not saying that would have solved all their problems because they had problems beyond recruiting at that point, but um, hard to recover from that. So in 2001, they finally realize it's time to move on. So they fire Speedy Morris and they bring in Billy Hahn, who had been an assistant coach with, I believe he'd been an assistant coach with Huggins at, Cincinnati. I know that I know afterwards he went back there, but was a guy who had been coming from bigger programs and he is only there for he's only there for three years. And the team, like the one year that kind of made a surprise run to the A10 semifinals, but they're still 
you know, losing records. He had been at Maryland, excuse me. He'd been an assistant at Maryland before that. And I'm looking at his biography. It looks like he was a Maryland alum. So, yep. And then what happened was in the summer of 2004, after I had been accepted and was planning on matriculating there in the fall, a national news story broke and LaSalle was national news for the first time in a very long time, which was that during a basketball camp, they were holding some of the players on the team and some of the other counselors who were, you know, players at other colleges. They were staying in the townhouses, which is where, you know, like upperclassmen live, but it's also like when the basketball team stays over the summer, they usually live in the townhouses. And one night during the camp, there had been a party in one of the townhouses and two players on the team, Gary Neal and Mike Cleaves, had sex with a female counselor from, I believe, the University of New Haven. And the details of it are pretty, I don't want to say graphic, but they're kind of sensational. Not that they're not true, but long story short, this was reported to the men's and women's coaches and the woman, uh, the female victim said she did not want to go forward with it. However, there's something called, I think it's the Butler Act. There's a specific act because it came up a lot during Penn State's scandal with the Jerry Sandusky sandal that says, if you're an, a school personnel, an administrator or a coach or something like that, and you have that kind of information, you are required to disclose it. And Billy Hahn and the, fee, and the woman's coach did not go through the proper channels. So this started to make news as if LaSalle was trying to cover it up. And... Ultimately, Neil and Cleves were charged with rape. They were ultimately acquitted because their contention was that it was consensual. And I guess there wasn't enough to convict. They were expelled from the university. The two coaches were fired. A few months later, there was a separate allegation about another player and another woman from a different, not from that same time frame, but there was another sexual assault allegation. Another guy who was a starter transferred in the wake of all of this. And LaSalle, this was well into the summer, had a head coaching vacancy. And this scandal was national news. And Neil, it's funny, I, I don't know if you were going to sort of close the book on him, but he has kind of a weird, he goes to Europe, first of all, he goes to, um, he plays in Towson in the Baltimore area for a couple of years. And then he goes- exactly. That year, he was the third leading scorer, the one year at Towson behind J.J. Redick and Adam Morrison. <laughs> Jeez. And then he, he plays in Europe for a while. And then he ends up, he's on the, he's on the Spurs for a couple of years. And he has in 13, which was the year that the Heat beat San Antonio. That was the year that Ray Allen hit the shot in one of the games, that, you know, that, to bring him back. And I remember watching the finals in 13 and he had, in, it was game three. So I, that actually might have been the Ray Allen game. He had 24 points. He was six of 10 from three pointer. No, I'm sorry. This was a game that the Spurs won. So he had like this one crazy game in the NBA finals to lead the Spurs against the Heat. And I just, I remember getting some, uh, some interesting text messages that night about uh, him. <laughs> For me? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, it's. So, he, he set the program back for God knows how long. And the problem I have, and we've talked about this before, was that suddenly it's a, you know, the next day on ESPN.com, there's stories about like, uh, Gary Neal has been through so much. And here he is after, you know, having to play at two different schools and going to Europe and all this. And now he's, you know, he's having this game in the finals. And my contention was, how about we at least mention why he had to go to two different schools? Because... I'll let you decide if you want to leave this in or not, but the, the facts of the case were not debated. The facts of the case were, it was just whether she was too drunk to consent or not. And the headline story was that him and Cleves had had sex with her while she was vomiting into the sink. And that was never refuted. That was, you know, that was the main mm -hmm. headline of the case, the top line, you know, so this was not a, nobody knows what happened. It was whether, you know, it was legal, whatever. So, and wasn't Stephen A. Smith, didn't he write an article saying parents don't send your kids or don't send your daughters to LaSalle? I mean, this it, was it, national Stephen, prominence. And I mean, he was writing in Philadelphia at the time. And you want to talk about a guy that was not liked at LaSalle when I was there. But um, he wrote an article that basically said, like, 
the school is trying to cover it up and that the president should be fired and that, you know, everybody should go because they they were trying to basically sweep this under the rug, which I don't think was true. I think the other thing, too, is that is such a hacky article to write. That's like such a Mike Lupica article. Whenever anything goes wrong at a college or in the front office of a protein, just fire everybody. It's like, okay, we get it. You know, you, you didn't feel like working very hard on your column this week. One last thing I want to say, and this is selfishly, and I'm not comparing it to what actually happened, but one of the other reasons I hold a lot against them is that a good portion of my freshman year at college was essentially the school was on lockdown. If you went to a party, the cops broke it up in five minutes because you could tell the school was like, we've had enough negative publicity and we need to show that we're taking a hard line. And they basically collaborated with the Pennsylvania liquor control board to have raids at every frat house one night and like arrest people. And like, you know, yeah, it was a very tough time at the school. And again, I'm not saying, but, but anyway, so they end up hiring John Giannini late in the year, you know, in the shortly before school begins, he had been the coach at the university of Maine before that he'd won a national championship at Rowan, which is in South Jersey as a, uh, I believe division two school. He'd won a national championship there. So he took over my freshman year. And again, they had lost basically all of their players. So there was not much expectation on that team my freshman year and they were bad. They played most of the year with seven scholarship players because there was an injury and then all the guys who'd gotten thrown off the team and there was no time to recruit. You should have tried out. It was a very fun team, even though they went 10 and 19. They played hard despite not having much talent. And then the next year was my sophomore year. And I'm not going to go year by year while I was at school, but it was the best year they had in a long time. They finally broke the streak. They went 18 and 10. They broke the losing streak. There was two losing streaks that year. They broke one was... They had not had a winning season in you know over 10 years at that point. And number two was that they had been something, they had lost like 15 big five games in a row and they finally won a big five game against Temple that year at home. I remember the game so that they wouldn't finish 0-4 in the big five for all four years of the seniors on that team's career. Their best player on that team was a guy named Steve Smith who... Got a cup of coffee in the NBA with the Sixers, but was, you know, a very, very good player, especially those last two years when he was really their only option or one of their only options. 19 points a game his senior year, 20 points the year before that, you know, eight and a half boards a game. A really nice career after his cup of coffee with the Sixers, went over to Europe for a long time, but um, was sort of like my first favorite LaSalle player those years. I remember you talking about him. And the, the 06 team was a bit of a heartbreaker because they got the number three seed in the A-10, and the first day of the tournament, they were going to play last that night. And earlier that day, the one, two, and four seeds lost. So they were the three seed playing the six seed, and the door was open. They were the highest seed remaining to possibly make the NCAA tournament. And then they lost. So all four teams, all four top teams lost. Yep. So, you know, the next year they stunk. And then in 07 and 08, they were okay my last year there. And then they had some decent years, no postseasons, but some decent years. And then I want to spend our last little bit of time on the two-year period when they got back to the postseason, first the NIT and then the NCAA. Did you leave out something big, though? Didn't you want to talk about in 04 when they were trying to bring in a coach? And So, so this, this is the thing. There's actually... So Fran Dunphy, who'd been on the team in the late 60s, went to Penn. And really, the time they really tried to get him was when Speedy left. Okay. So when in, after 01... He, he went to Penn and, and, you know, Penn was a perennial Ivy League champion. It was them or Princeton almost every year. And they were making the tournament every year. And when they fired Speedy, they tried to get Dumphy, you know, and he's an alum and you'd have liked to see him come and he turned them down. And then three years later, when they really needed him after the scandal, and he would have basically been the savior of the program. Sort of like Gola was. Yeah, who was on, and he was on that team, and he wouldn't come. 
And the quote I've always heard, and to be honest, I can't find any source material for him saying this. Maybe he did, but he basically said, well, I want to stay at Penn for the rest of my life. And then two years later, he takes the Temple job. 06, 07, Cheney retires. Dunphy takes the Temple job. Even though I understand it. I understand him staying at Penn. And I understand him taking the Temple job. As an alum and especially the 04 situation. And then he leaves two years later and goes to Temple, who at the time was in the same league as LaSalle, too. They were both in the Atlantic 10 at the time. Take, you know, takes over right down Broad Street and takes over a team in the same league. As fans, we're allowed to be pissed about that. And he probably would have bothered you a little less if he had gone to Madison, Wisconsin, or you know, just some other random school. Yeah, he stays in the same league and the same city and... Rivalry. Now, again, I understand the advantages Temple has to LaSalle, but as he's an alumni. So that still frustrates me to this day, even though, again, they're justifiable decisions. It still does frustrate me. So what I want to zoom to, as I know even for a second episode, we've gone very long here, but, you know, they had some good years. They had some 18 win seasons, but you mentioned the transfers and they'd had some success with it. They had a guy named Earl Pettis who came back from Rutgers as a transfer, played some years with LaSalle and they'd done it a little bit, but the 2011, 2012 team is one of the most surprising teams for one specific reason, which I'll get to in a minute. They went 21 and 12. They had a junior on the team who had transferred back from South Carolina named Ramon Galloway. And he was able to get a waiver to not sit out a year. And the reason for that was that he came back because his family was from Philadelphia. Uh, His father was blind legally. His family had some hardships and he was able to get a waiver to not have to sit out a year. So he was eligible his first year at LaSalle in 2011, 2012. They had a guy on the team, a sophomore guard named Tyreek Duran and also Sam Mills. And then two freshmen, big net, big men, Steve Zach and, uh, and Jarrell Wright. Oh, both freshmen. So it was a very young team and they had a good year. They went 21 and 12 and lost in the, to Temple in the A-10 tournament. And we were already on the message board kind of going, ah, it was a good season. It would have been nice if they could have won a few more games and maybe, you know, gotten to the NIT or something like that. Literally nobody was talking about any postseason options. And the NIT selection show that night, not only did LaSalle get in, they got in as a three seed which means they weren't that far off the bubble Mm -hmm. and nobody knew it. Like (laughs) nobody was talking about LaSalle as a potential making the NIT, let alone they were a high seed. They got to host the first round. They lost to Minnesota, but they played a really good game. They ended up losing by nine, but it was also, it was on, it was like not every NIT game is on TV, but that was one of the ones that was on ESPN that night. And it was at home and I think Galloway had like a really insane dunk in that game that got somebody did. I think it was Galloway that got a lot of play on TV. So, you know, it was, it was nice. And then that set the stage for the next season, which we'll pretty much wrap up on this. We don't need to talk about the last five or six years. And I would just say the thing I remember, cause I went to a few games with you in those years. The thing I remember about Galloway is this guy could just shoot from anywhere. And this next year, 12-13, you came to a game with me at the Palestra against St. Joe's with, with our father. And I said to you, because he had a weird shot. It was not a traditional looking shot, but he would shoot from anywhere on the court. And I said to you, so our, our best player is 55. He's got a weird looking shot and he shoots from wherever. So if you see him the first time down the court, if he shoots from three steps inside the half court line and misses with that weird shot, you might be like, what is this guy doing? Yeah, why are they playing this guy? Trust me, he hits most of them. So they came into that season, and I'm not going to say they had crazy high expectations, but probably higher expectations than you would see for a LaSalle team. And that was a weird year in the Atlantic 10 because Temple had already announced their intention to leave at the end of that season. They were going to the Big East to play football, didn't end up happening. They ended up in the American for the conference shakeups. They were leaving. Charlotte was going to leave, but they were both in the league one more year. To fill their spots, they went to the A10, went to the Horizon League and added Xavier and Butler for that one for that year. So 
they were not supposed to join for another year, but the Horizon League kicked them out when they found out they were leaving. So for that one year, you had this very big league with Xavier, Butler, Temple, Dayton, uh, St. Joe's, LaSalle, St. Bonaventure. It was one year of it. Because after that, Temple was gone. Charlotte was gone. Xavier left for the Big East. Butler was only in the league one year. So it was a very big confluence of events. And LaSalle was off to a pretty good start in the league or in, you know, early in the year in non conference play. They got off to a, a nine and or they were actually a 10 and three start. But, you know, they had lost to Miami, they had lost to Central Connecticut who was bad. That was a terrible loss and almost knocked them out. They lost to Bucknell. And as league play started at 10 and four, it was like, uh, this will probably be a little bit like last year. Maybe they'll get back into the NIT. Started off a couple of wins. They, they lost to Charlotte, but then they beat Richmond and then they beat Dayton. And then they had a one week period that was by far the best one week in LaSalle basketball history or, you know, in recent LaSalle basketball history, number nine seed Butler came into LaSalle uh, on a Wednesday night to play January 23rd. They were, Butler was the number nine team in the country. LaSalle beat them 54 to 53 in a game that was very famous because it was a double court storming. LaSalle's fans stormed the court after it looked like they won. The refs called, sent everybody back off the court, reviewed it, said there should still be some time on the clock. Luckily, they didn't call any technicals or anything like that. They just ordered everybody off the court. Butler inbounded, actually got a pretty good look off, missed. Fans all stormed the court again. LaSalle beat the number nine team in the country. They were the back page of the Philadelphia Daily News the next day. And that was still, that was Brad Stevens last year with Butler. So that was still him. It's the the article was but LaSalle did it because they beat Butler like the Butler did it. They were the back page of the Philadelphia Daily News. It was like, oh, wow, what a great game. Three days later, they went down to Richmond to play Virginia Commonwealth, who was also new to the league. I said before Xavier and Butler joined the league. I met Butler and BCU joined the league. Xavier had obviously already been in the league. Yeah. Butler and BCU that joined the league. Butler from the Horizon League, VCU from the CAA. So then they're playing VCU, who was the number 19 team in the country, and they beat VCU. So in four days, they beat the number nine team in the country and the number 19 team in the country. And literally four days earlier, Nobody had been talking about this, and all of a sudden, it was like, you know, they're 14 and 5, and they just beat two top 20 teams. They might actually make the tournament. That was sort of the thought. And, you know, they had a few stumbles after that. They lost their next game to UMass. Uh, then they, they had that St. Joe's game, which was the game you were at with me. And then they had a chance to win the big five outright for the first time. And they'd already clinched at least tying the big five. And they had a chance to win the big five outright against Temple on the 21st of February. If they won, they would have been 4-0 in the big five. They beat Villanova earlier in that year on a buzzer beater. or to for, They had a buzzer beater to force overtime and then beat Villanova in overtime. It's the only time since I've been following the program they've beaten Villanova. And I've been following the program now for 17 years. Only time they've beaten Villanova. Wow. Um, Villanova was down at the time, but still, it's the only time they've beaten them. Temple, LaSalle only ended up losing by eight, but Temple really beat the crap out of them. The last game of the regular season, if they had won, they would have been the number one seed in the A-10 tournament. They were playing St. Louis. St. Louis killed them. It was actually the day I moved into this apartment. I was the first thing I did. I'd just finished moving in and watched LaSalle get their butts kicked by St. Louis. So they fell all the way down to the four seed. And in the four five matchup in the A-10 tournament against Butler, they lost. And it seemed like that was going to put them out the whole train ride home with my father. Cause the tournament was in Brooklyn. I was the most miserable. <laughs> I, just, I just kept coming up with random teams that they were going to play in the NIT I was like, oh, yeah, well, this will be great in three weeks or in in four nights when I get to watch them play Nebraska in the NIT. 
how great it'll i'm excited to watch them play navy i just i did that the whole way home i was miserable and then something happened which was the next few days everything they needed in the other conference tournaments broke right it falls just the right way and that sunday night i'm sitting there watching it and you know this this show that i've watched for years never having lasalle be a thought in my mind and i'm like on pins and needles of course they're the last region called and they end up in the play-in game against boise state as a 13 seed that's right they were in the play-in game that's right and they cut to the team watching and the team went nuts and there's a little tinge of me like well they're in the play-in game so if they lose is this really gonna count that they were in the tournament but also it's like they haven't been in the tournament in 21 years we should enjoy this but there was still a part of me that's like uh, if they go out there and lose and it's over before the tournament even really starts. Well, they went out to Dayton and played Boise state in the play in game. They beat up on Boise state. Boise state got back into it a little bit late in the game. So it looked a little closer than it was, but they were never in doubt in the game. So they make the tournament as a 13 seed. They go to Kansas city to play Kansas state. So as you can imagine what that crowd would have been like, 13 against four matchup against Kansas State. And LaSalle had a big lead in the first half. And it was one of those where you just watched it tick, 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 <laughs> way, to the point where it's like, okay, well, they're screwed. They're going to lose. And they managed to regain the lead the big key in this game was that Jarrell Wright their big man who was a pretty bad free throw shooter before and after this it's not like he figured it out forever after this but he was what was his three point percentage in that he was nine of ten from three point and this is a from guy, free throw you mean right from, yeah, excuse me from free from the free throw line and this is a guy who five of ten you'd have been like good enough he ended up with 21 points, nine of them from the free throw line. Galloway ended up with 19 as well. And they ended up winning 63 to 61 to go to the second round. It was their first tournament win since 1990. And they were on their way to the second round of the tournament. And by, as luck would have it, the five seed also lost Wisconsin. So they were playing the number 12 seed, Ole Miss. And that was the Marshall Henderson Ole Miss team where he was getting a lot of um, publicity, shall we say, for his brashness and outspoken ways. And LaSalle played Ole Miss on Sunday night, March 24th, 2013. And there's a very famous among LaSalle people clips clip of... John Giannini before the game talking to his players in the locker room. And as they huddle up, he says, again, it's a Sunday night. He says, after this game, one of two things could happen. He said, we're either in class tomorrow at 8 a.m. Or we're on our way to Los Angeles for the Sweet 16. Because they weren't going home. If like if they won, they were going to go straight out to L.A. Mm -hmm. or, or, we can, or we can go out to Los Angeles for the Sweet 16. And... In this game, I won't go blow by blow for anybody who is at all familiar with this game. Late in the game, another transfer, a guy who'd only been eligible since halfway through the year, a transfer from Virginia Tech, Tyrone Garland, drove the lane and hit a floater slash layup with only a couple of seconds left. Ole Miss had to throw up a buzzer beat or Hail Mary that didn't go in. The crowd went nuts or the, you know, the team went nuts. They rushed the floor. And after the game, Craig Sager interviews Tyrone Garland about the play. And he's explaining what happened. And then he told Tyreek Duran, the point guard in the huddle Duran had asked him if that was open. And he said it was. And then Craig Sager asks him, what do you call that play? And he says, that's the Southwest Philly floater, man. Shout out, to, shout out to my cousin, Burn. And then he said a few other things and then yelled Southwest. He said a few, he didn't curse. I mean, he just said a few other, he said a few more shout outs. But he said, that's, that's the Southwest Philly floater. Shout out to my cousin, Burn. 
and LaSalle was on the way to the Sweet 16. And the nice thing about the Sweet 16 is there's like four days in between. That's true. So for those four days from Sunday to Thursday, somewhat nationally. Now, that was unfortunately also the year that Gulf Coast went to the Sweet 16, so they got attention as well. But LaSalle was a national story. Mike Lupica wrote a big article about them in the New York Daily News where he interviewed John Giannini. John Giannini was all over the radio, nationally, in New York even, everywhere. And then locally, Garland, because Gar- Garland with the sort of signature dreadlocks and the headband, there were clips of the local like hip hop station had a video of them all in the office. And the one guy was wearing like a mop on his head, pretending to be Garland. And like, (laughs) like he had like one of those little nerf hoops in the Mm -hmm. office, like laying it in and then doing the interview and saying Southwest Philly floater. And it was a legitimate phenomenon and it lasted beyond those four days. But for those four days, it was a legitimate phenomenon. They went out to Los Angeles and played Wichita state. And it was clear from the start that Wichita State was just too much for them inside. They end up losing by 14. They were pretty much out of the game from the beginning. But LaSalle to the Sweet 16 in 2013, just a a forever memory for... It's the best... It's the closest they've gotten to a national championship since 1955. 1989 was... Excuse me. 1990 was a team that was a really high seed, but they lost in the second round. 1969 was a team that finished ranked number two, but they were ineligible for the postseason. The last time they had gotten that close to a championship was 1955. So it will be forever. Any fan who, especially if you're like me, who was not old enough to remember anything before, you know, 04, it will be a tough year to beat. Unfortunately, the next year, with the whole team back except for Galloway, they should have been better than they were the next year. They finished like a game over 500. I'll try to end on a relatively positive note. Unfortunately, they didn't really capitalize on that in terms of interest or fundraising into a new facility or any of that to the point where by now, even the 2013 team is a distant memory for most people unfortunately and giannini leaves after the what like the 18 season what what is it is it just time for a break or you know time for a new voice with him or the year after that the year after 13 there was a big fear that giannini was going to leave he was going to take the rutgers job or he was going to take a you know because they made this he made the sweet 16 with a huge handicap yeah there were, but he didn't end up taking it Ended up staying at LaSalle with an extension. Coach there for another four or five years. Again, some okay teams, some really bad teams. And they got some trade. They kept with the transfer thing. BJ Johnson comes from Syracuse, which was, you know, certainly a a blessing. And he was the best player LaSalle's had post Ramon Galloway, but really couldn't capitalize. And it got to the point where, you know, he'd been the coach for 15 years and it was just time. So they finally relieved Janini of the coaching duties and they go to a guy who, when I first got to LaSalle, Janini first got to LaSalle, a guy on his coaching staff was a young guy named Ashley Howard, who was only with LaSalle maybe four or five years and as an assistant, went on sort of his merry way, re- working his way up the coaching ranks to the point where was the top assistant at Villanova under Jay Wright when Jay Wright won those, when the Villanova won those national championships. Right after their second national championship, within a week of that, he had taken the LaSalle job, really the most home run hire you could hope for on paper, guy with Philadelphia ties, assistant on a team that just won two of the last three national championships, you know, young, youngish African-American, you know, ties to Philadelphia, like you would really, you know, and this, he's been there three years and I'm still willing to give him a little more time this year, especially being a bit of a wash of COVID. Unfortunately, the with every passing year, the the 2013 team seems more and more like the combination of a fluke. And also, to me, I look at it and I say, since 1992, this team has made the postseason twice. Ramon Galloway was on the team two years. The overlap of those is a perfect circle. <laughs> and I start to, you know, he's my favorite LaSalle player of all time, even though he's only been there for two years. He was only there for two years. 
I lean in the category of, yeah, Tyreek Durham was a good player. Tyrone Garland was a very good player. I think it was Galloway. I think Galloway was the reason that those things happened. And yeah, he came into a, a decently strong cast, but um, the last really great LaSalle moment, and certainly I have a vision for what I'd like. You know, I have fantasies, sounds a little tawdry, but what I'd like to see from them in, you know, the rest of my life as a program. But honestly, even if they were to become like a perennial tournament team, I don't know that I'd ever see a Sweet 16 again. And certainly not a, it was brief but intense that they were the talk of Philadelphia for a little while. Not the Flyers or the Sixers or Villanova or anyone else. And the fact that it happened in March, not the Eagles. For even a week for them to be, you know, there's talk right now about when we're recording this right before the tournament starts. There's only two teams, only two Philly area teams made the NCAA tournament this year. And Villanova is weaker than they've been in a long time. A lot of people, what they're talking about right now is Drexel. Now, Drexel's a 16 seed. Drexel's probably going to get their butts kicked in the first round. By the time this airs, they almost definitely will have gotten their butts kicked. But they haven't made the tournament in 25 years. So people are talking about Drexel. And that's sort of how it was with LaSalle and even more intense because they were in the Sweet 16. You know, it's funny. D.C. and um, Philly are kind of kind of similar when it comes to college sports. I think D.C. maybe is a little more top-heavy in that we have Maryland and Georgetown, and the only one really comparable to that level is is Villanova. At the in, mo- at the well, I mean, yeah, I mean, for the for a long, you know, Maryland and Georgetown have both, you know, been national championship contenders in the last, you know, twenty or thirty years, and then, but then, like, you know, sort of the next tier, the LaSalle, St. Joe's, Temple tier, DC doesn't really have as much of that. Maybe Mason, but one thing I've seen both with Mason and with Georgetown here is that when you make it to that second weekend, the city not just the sports fans, but also just the people in the city in general, that's kind of when they sit up and take notice is when you make it to that second weekend. So that that's sort of to your point is that you understand why that's such a special moment for LaSalle fans. I actually have an interesting Galloway story real quick. The year after his senior year, after he graduated, my wife, then girlfriend bought me, bought us tickets to this summer league thing that they did in DC. I don't know if they still do it. And it's basically guys who just got out of college and don't have any sort of pro contract or are looking to break in. And it's, you know, it's played, it's not an outside thing. It's played at local colleges and stuff. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a full on league, but the one sort of quirk is that they have a four point line. That's, you know, but several feet back from the three point line. And I remember as soon as I got there and saw the four point line and saw that Galloway was on one of the teams, I remember I said to Allison, I was like, this guy is cut out for this league because this guy will shoot the ball from anywhere on the court and had have a decent chance of going in. So he was in the college dunk contest that year and everything. So, I mean, he was, you know, had some, had some, problems. he got some attention. Yeah. So, you know, I, that kind of brings us to the end of um, where we're at. There would certainly be more about the current state we could talk about, but the 2013 team was really the last major highlight worth ending on. That If somebody wrote the book right now, that'd be the last big chapter. Yes. So it's a, it's a program with, just to sort of summarize, it's a program with tremendous, tremendous history. Tom Gola is still the leading NCAA rebounder of all time. Lionel Simmons is the third leading scorer, or now he's the fourth, I guess, leading scorer in program history, or excuse me, in NCAA Division I history. Other names like Ken Durrett, Michael Brooks. Paul uh, Westhead. Paul Westhead, guys associated with the program. The Philadelphia Big Five, although it's not what it once was is in, in importance. It is, you know, it's been back to the round robin for 20 years or almost 20 years now. It's still the big five LaSalle basketball. If 2013 showed you anything, it's that obviously it would take a level of success that they're not capable of sustaining at the moment, but if they catch lightning in a bottle, they can still capture the imagination of a, City, there was a, and I'll very quickly end on this. There was in 2013 when they were getting ready to go to the Sweet 16, some website, I don't remember what it was, 
whether it was SB Nation or or something like that, did like little videos about every team that was still playing. And I realized I haven't watched the LaSalle one in a really long time. And yeah, you know, they would play kind of like dramatic music and they, they cut to one of the guys. I forget who it was. It was a, a Philadelphia reporter or something. And he said like, you know, it seemed like for a while people had kind of, and it was a shot of the empty quad on at LaSalle in winter. And I think it was when the statue was still there. They had a, a statue that was on the quad that everybody would kind of laugh and call creepy. And then it turned out it was really valuable. So right away they put it in the art museum when they found out it was really valuable. But it was like an empty quad and it was like, it's kind of like piano music. And the guy was like, you know, it was almost like people had kind of forgotten about LaSalle. It was almost like Drexel had kind of taken their place in the big five and that people had kind of nudged LaSalle aside. Well, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Just the way you said it, it just still kind of gives me chills. So hopefully one day again, and hopefully that day is relatively soon, we, we can experience that again of people pouring out onto 20th and only to celebrate like they did that night. LaSalle went to the Sweet 16. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for sharing all of those thoughts and memories. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of Hello Old Sports, two episodes where we dove into the history. I'm sorry? Maybe three. <laughs> Maybe three. I don't, I don't know. A, a three-parter might, uh, I don't know. That We'll probably just stick with two. But uh, until I hit the editing room, we, we won't know for sure. But thank you all very much for joining us. Deep dive into the history of LaSalle University Explorers Basketball. Until next time, I'm Dan Newman. And I'm Andrew Newman. Fight on Explorers. The Hawk is dead. Goodbye, old sports. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.